James Khan is one of the UK's most successful and dynamic entrepreneurs. He's amassed an 85 million pound fortune through creating global recruitment businesses and from his private equity empire in London's Mayfair. With an impeccable track record of creating and managing companies, he's now taking this first-hand knowledge on the road to mentor six of the UK's most vibrant small and medium-sized enterprises. He's on a mission to navigate the entrepreneurs through the challenges they face, to seize market opportunities, and to boost their bottom line. With James's nearly 30 years of business expertise, will the young companies make the change or stick to their ways? The business class begins here. In this episode, we explore the global skincare market, a market that's worth $80 billion. In the last four years, this market's grown by nearly 4% a year. What I love about this focus on this episode is we're going to be looking at one of the modern entrepreneurs, somebody that found a problem and then found a solution. And what I particularly like about this is that she invested her own money into her own business. Joining me now is Sue Harmsworth, founder of Espar International, and Charles Denton, CEO of Erno Laszlo. Welcome to the business class. Thank you. Allow me to introduce company two, Pi Skincare. This is a firm looking to grow in a competitive market. Let's take a closer look. My name's Sarah Brown and I'm the founder of Pi Skincare. I set up the business in 2007 and we now employ 10 members of staff. We sell in about 18 countries around the world and we are forecast to do just under a million this year. So James, you've seen the company profile, we've got the founder waiting in the wings, but what is your first impression? I mean, clearly a very impressive business, Carolyn. And we're talking about 100% growth year on year since 2009. What I particularly liked here is this is an individual who spotted a problem in the market, very passionate about the solution, and clearly has thrown herself into the business to create what she's got today. So first impressions, I think a great business. I really admire what Sarah's done. I think um, she, she's really passionate about her business. Her problem has got to be to focus on one section of the business. At the moment, it's almost like she's running multiple businesses. And the amount of business she's turned down is obviously going to become an issue. Uh, and I think the scalability, so she's manufacturing in London and having that kind of facility in London just isn't cost effective when you start to scale it up. So Charles, do you agree with this? I do, many points I do. Uh, I think their challenge is they're not a unique story and they talk about coming to market uh, and many competitors joining them. They've been there a while. So finding their point of difference and standing out in what is already a crowded market is very, very difficult. Everybody eats off everybody else's table and it's, it's increasingly hard to differentiate yourself. Each episode, our entrepreneurs give us their two biggest challenges. Let's take a look at the first one. 50% of our revenues come from online and we've had a great experience selling direct to customers because we get to control their complete experience. With this in mind, should we be opening our own store or sticking with our existing distribution model? I get the argument of why you'd want to open a store. I mean, I can see why Apple, despite they have a massive following of, of, of their products, but they still believe in the concept of opening a store. I think from Pi's perspective, maybe the idea of people being ha having the opportunity to go into a retail store to test the product to see if it's right for them. I've had that same dilemma myself. And I think if you do one concept store, we call them concept stores. Um, which Just to get an idea, Sue, what sort of budget does somebody need to have to open that sort of concept store? Well, I think if it's a statement of your brand and who you are and the way you want to go forward, high street, leasing, although times are obviously better from that perspective, I would still say three to 400,000. Would you agree with that, Charles? Yeah, I would. I think you've got to fund the losses, you've got to fund the deposit, you've got to fund the stock, you've got to fund the shop fit. 
uh, I would, there wouldn't be much change out of that. Uh, and also, they haven't got sufficient breadth of product. I think, uh, is it 16 SKUs they have at the moment? Uh, something like that. It, it's far too little. So what would happen is they would be drawn into creating product just to fill out the store. Uh, opening a store is a new business. They're already running four businesses. So I think this is the last... What do you mean by that, Charles? Well, they, they have a manufacturing business, they have an e-commerce business, they have a wholesaling business, they also sell to spas, which is an entirely new business in terms of training and the like, and the retailing is a new business again. So we're saying no to opening the store? Yes. Totally. Our hosts James Kahn and mentor Sue Harmsworth from Espa and Charles Denton from Erno Laszlo have been looking at the challenges facing Pi. In a minute, I'm going to grab the founder, but first, James, let's bring you challenge number two. We've had approaches from big chains in the US and Canada, which we turned down at the time because we simply weren't ready. If we were to launch in a single large chain in the US, what do we do to guarantee success? We can't afford to fail in this critical market. I think one of the key issues for me would be Research and development, you know, is quite a big part of the overall cost base here. So entering a market where the legal frameworks, the regulatory environments, that could be quite prohibitive in relation to profitability. Mm -hmm. So yes, entering a market, I get it, but I want to do it profitably. And my fear is the US is the kind of graveyard of UK businesses. Even if you go in with a very good retailer, you'll need warehousing for distribution because they'll want their product quickly they won't be prepared for it to be shipped um, the training is different altogether so your UK trainers won't be able to train they they'd need to train in a completely different way I think the support system you need would be huge margins are big there's department stores in the US want very big margins and again the cost of entry is very high I think two, two other things that you really have to understand is that a 20 pound product in England is a $20 product in America in terms of affordability. So when you take a product from the UK to America, you have that as a real challenge. So are we saying, Charles, that she should stay out of the US market? I think that what will happen if she goes into the US market without a substantial marketing budget behind her is that she will fail. And we know she doesn't have a substantial marketing budget. So the danger is that what will happen is you'll start to trade in the environment, she'll suddenly realise that she needs more investment, she'll start, she'll be a weak, in a weak position seeking investors. Therefore her valuation will go down and she will be on the back foot. Far better to build a stronger footprint in the UK, generate some profitability and if she's thinking about the US market in the future, raise the money from a stronger position. I mean, so I suppose our general consensus is that the US dangerous market, costly market, and right now in terms of focus, we think the opportunity is better in her domestic market in the UK. It's time for our experts to meet Sarah Brown. Hi Sarah, welcome to business class. Hi Sarah, nice to meet you. Hi Charles. What were your thoughts and observations on that? Um, I think your comments were all um, very, very interesting. Some I agreed with, some I didn't so much. Um, but I think your assessment of the business, or for businesses, as I should say, I think is very fair. I think in order for you to achieve your ambitions without raising money, yeah. I think you're doing it the hard way. But I think because you've got four different businesses, mm. I think your margin and your conversion mm of revenue to profitability, you've sacrificed that. So now you're caught because you want to raise money, but your profitability isn't strong enough, and therefore you're going to have to give away too much equity in order to raise money. Yeah. And if I was in your position, it's probably not worth doing. Yeah. So raising capital probably is key, but also doing it at the right price. We've almost come to the end of the show, but as promised, here's the viewer question for you, James. At One Stop Energy 2020 tweets in and asks, how can you vet your investors so that they do not become a problem in your business? Actually, Carolyn, that's a great question. My advice would be the best way to do that is if you check that the investor has got other investments, 
and make sure that you can call some of the companies that he's already invested in and take a reference. What you want to find out is what relationship does that investor have with some of those other companies and having checked a reference, that's when you should make that decision as to whether you should take his investment.